Next is cleaning the PCB. This is kind of up to you because some of the fluxes are no clean or leave very little residue. But watch SDG Electronics how important is cleaning flux from your PCBs which shows the effects of leaving flux on a PCB for two months and you'll kind of realise it's better safe than sorry. Plus when the flux is removed it's easier to see the solar joints and if they have good connection. The usual procedure is to clean it with isopropyl alcohol, IPA or methylated spirits. But if you've got heavy resin based flux it's very slow work or hardly works at all. And that's when people usually switch to acetone. The problem with acetone it damages some plastics so you have to be super careful with the application and what parts it touches. I then remembered kerosene melts wax and doesn't affect plastics and with a bit of testing found out it worked a lot better on the resin fluxes. If IPA does the job use that but I had to go caro first. Coarse stiff brush to break the big lumps because kerosene is not that aggressive. Fine soft brush to be more thorough. Flush off with methylated spirits. Methylated spirits is cheaper than IPA and repeat all that on the bottom. Try to avoid getting dissolved flux in parts with contacts inside them like the trimmer pot, joystick, USBs and card holder because it could gum up the contacts inside them. Next I use some strong grease cutting spray. There's something about this gluey resin that leaves this sticky film over everything and this spray gets rid of that. It's the usual coarse brush, fine brush. If you're worried about the conductive salts in tap water just use distilled water but I usually just hose it down with high pressure. I also have a final clean after this just to be safe. The final wash is IPA. And Metho flush. And blow out with compressed air. Next is inspection. I know it sounds like a lot of work but I'll visually inspect every single soldered joint with high magnification. Basically if something like this was made professionally in large numbers it would be checked with a bed of nails and possibly automated optical checking. It doesn't take that long and you only have to do it once and it could save from a critical failure. You can use loop glasses or a magnified headset. This headset came with five different magnification lenses which can be stacked for even more magnification or some sort of camera. I use a cheap USB microscope. Make sure you get the one with the minimum magnification because at its minimum magnification of 25 times there's just enough room to work under it. Basically if I could get less than 25 times I would buy that one instead. You could even angle it to better see if the solder is attached to the pad. You can put it full size on your monitor so the parts are massive and that makes it fairly quick to check all the joints. That's 10 joints in 10 seconds. If I see something suspicious but not obvious, I'll go in with the loop glasses for a more natural look. Like I might go in with the loops to check if this is an inclusion. There's a known failure rate in the industry of ceramic capacitors cracking after soldering. Probably more prevalent in high tin solders because it's a much harder and rigid material. And to get around it, they sometimes use special capacitors with a flexible joint in them. We're using cheap rigid capacitors, so if you want to be pedantic, like I am, you check each one. Even though this is a rare failure, it's not hard to do a quick check with tweezers and a digital multimeter. On a side note, eBay tweezers don't make good contact, so you have to wiggle them, so it might be better using needlepoint probes. Also, this digital multimeter isn't very good at reading small value capacitors when the batteries aren't brand new. I couldn't see any solder faults on the bottom, but there was rock hard flux residue. I think the flux in the ChemTool solder paste hardens when you heat it too long. According to SDG Electronics, some fluxes harden to protect the joint, but I'm going to try to remove it by washing this PCB again. On the top I found something that looks like a solder bridge. The eye bomb looks like they're touching, but we can go to the schematic. We've got R430 touching D421, but we can be more sure by going to the PCB layout. And this is our R430 and our D421. If we click on the pad, we see they're connected. You're actually clicking on the trace but because you can't see it you might have to click in a few places. So it's not bridged, it's supposed to be that way. I also found one solder joint missing on the hand solder jumper link. This looks suspiciously like a bridged joint. Looking at R613 and R616 I click on the traces and they don't look connected so it must be a bridge. 
We can also check the schematic. R613 and R616 are separated. As a tip for looking at the schematic, they all have a similar number series per page. Like most of the stuff on this page has 600 series numbers on it. So look for a number series on the page to find stuff quick. I probably should have used a better method because I melted the plastic of the resistors. But to move them I used a blade tip across the top of the resistor so it touched both end caps at once. Because melting both solder joints at once is easier. It took roughly 15 minutes per side to check all the solder joints on this board using this method. Which is rather quick. And considering we found two faults that could have caused the failure, it was well worth it. You can see that it's kind of quick. In fact, if you took double the time, it would still be worth it. If you look at the top side where I used the mechanic solder paste, there's not much flux residue, and what there is comes off very easily, so it seems like a better solder paste. Ideally, you'd want to do the first power up with a current limiting power supply, but not many people have one of those. But we can check the resistance of the power rails to ground. Basically, if we get zero ohms or a very low value, we know there's something wrong. The Frankenzo is a four layer board. There's a bottom copper layer, an internal ground plane, an internal power plane, and a front copper layer. And this power plane is a five volt supply, which is what we'll be checking first. If you want to know which five volt test points go out to the outside layers, just click on power and it's any of these through holes with the spokes in them. If you want to know what these spokes are, they stop the heat of your soldering iron bleeding out to this large copper plane, and that makes it easier to solder to. And to find these easier, just turn on the silk screen, and then highlight it by clicking on the front arrow, and that'll make them easier to find. The ground plane is the same, just turn it on, turn off the power plane, and click the highlight arrow to the front. And it's the one with the spokes again. You don't really need the KiCad to spot the test points because there's numerous 5 volts and grounds printed on the board. This one's showing about 4 kilo ohms. About 2k ohms here. Another 2k. About 3.7k. I'm pretty happy with the 5 volt plane, but feel free to check other points. Next we'll check the 12 volt rail. That's not right. 0.4 ohms is way too low. Pin 1B is the major 12 volt input supply. And pins 3A to D are ground, and it's showing a dead short. It's actually hard to find shorts, even for pros. That is, unless it's obvious. And that means the first check is usually visual. First thing you do is try to narrow it down. And thankfully this is in the 12 volt rail, which is a lot smaller than the 5 volt rail. We know we have a short on 1B, this 12 volt switch. And the places that have 12 volt is page 3, this ADC amp driver down here. Page 3 only shows 1 12 volt, and that's to measure the battery voltage. And it stops at this resistor. So there's not much here. Next is the high load drivers on page 2 down here. And your 12 volts are going into these connectors. And if you look at the eye bomb, they're just headers where you select 12 volts or 5 volts. So the 12 volt line stops here and the onboard buck converter on page 9 over here. This is our 12 volt battery in and by virtue of it having more parts, this looks like the first place you'd look. We've visually checked every soldered joint for every part twice and there's nothing obvious. And this board hasn't been powered yet, so we're not going to find any easily found blown parts. We could have put this diode in backwards which would directly link the 12 volts to the ground, but diodes have a forward voltage drop, meaning that it has internal resistance when it's flowing, so it should read higher than 0 ohms. It's about now where people start randomly checking across parts for shorts. The problem is the short is going to mask any part between the rails, so you have to physically pull them out and test them on the bench. It's not common having a solder bridge with a stencil, because it puts down such a small volume, unless the gaps are small, like in fine pitch pins. Here we have large parts, so you'd think you're relatively safe. It's a zero ohms, that's the hint, in that it's very direct, like a bridge. And that's when I remembered the body of these parts are usually connected to ground internally, and I found this bridge. And if you look how small the gap is, it's a prime position for a bridge. I had checked every part connection twice, but I didn't check random vias on the board. So the lesson is check everything, even the stuff you're not using. If 
you follow the 12 volt switch down from pin 1B, it comes down here to this pad here. And the mounting body of this regulator is all ground, so if they were connected together it would be a dead short. I tried numerous times, but I couldn't wick that bridge off, and I didn't have hot air to take the part off, so in the end I had to Dremel cut it. When you fit this part, fit it far left, not that there's much room on the left side of the pins, or grind this tab shorter before you fit the part. Checking the 12 volt now, we're having about 38k. Ground to pin 1B, the 12 volt switch, is now also 38k, which should now be ok to apply power to the board. Other ways I've seen pros find shorts is with a 6 digit multimeter. A 6 digit multimeter is sensitive enough to see the small change in resistance the closer you get to the short. The problem is, is we don't have a 6 digit multimeter and it only really gets you in the area of the short. The other way is they use a current limiting power supply and slowly give it more current. You would probably try 250 to 500 milliamps and then fill the board for hot spots. One amp would be about the limit. When people get desperate, they'd go to 1 to 1.5 amps and try to burn the short out. But that's a bit risky because it can damage other parts. It's unlikely this would have burnt away to produce an open circuit. And this shows that using a digital multimeter before powering it on is a much better idea. Next we have to check the 3 volt rail. And we have a high resistance that's slowly dropping. 1 mega ohm sounds too much, like there's something missing. And the dropping resistance is like a capacitor charging up. It's like the 3 volt power supply is on the STM32 discovery board, so it needs to be plugged in. We're now getting 1.8k, which is a lot more reasonable. 1.4k sounds ok. Feel free to look up other test points in the schematics and test them. We connect positive 12 volts to pin 1B, the lower one, and negative to one of the ground pins. We turn on the power and we get a green LED. We check a 5 volt point on the board and we get 370 millivolts, which is not right. We check pin 1 of the regulator and it says 12 volts. We check pin 2 of the regulator and it shows our 5 volts, yet it's not getting to the rest of the board. It's also using only 20 milliamps, which is a bit low. If you look at this photo, you can just make out a 0 ohm link here for part W23. And it's this link that links the 5 volts to the rest of the board. We fit our W23 link. This is another thing that can probably be done in the soldering oven stage. We click on the power and we get 3 LEDs this time. Also the current draw has jumped to 40 milliamps now. We check onboard 5 volts and we now have close to 5 volts. So it's now OK. We check our 3 volt rail and there's nothing. So we plug in our STM32 discovery board because it has a 3 volt regulator. We check our 3 volt rail and it's fine now. We are also using 130 milliamps which is much more appropriate. The LEDs on our discovery board are blinking so it looks like it's running but we'll have to plug it in to be sure. We can power the board with a mini USB and if we test a 5 volt rail on the board we're getting about 4.5 volts and the 3 volt rail is about 2.9 volts and the current draw is between 1 and 200 milliamps. We have to connect the jumpers for our onboard stimulator or else there won't be a trigger. I have a detailed video on how to set up the stimulator but the quick version is connect PC6 to PD1 and PA5 to PD2. Plug in the mini USB for power. The COM port is not important because it's only for power. Plug in the micro USB for communication. Note the COM port that appears, mine is 31. Go to the RUS EFI bundle, go to the version folder and inside the console folder and click on RUS EFI console. Set the COM port to that of the micro and select connect. We see our trigger inputs coming in and our program outputs. And that's as much as we can check until we can put actual voltages in and check the output pulses which will confirm all our sub circuits are working. If you want to see it running on external power supply, here it is. Plug in the micro. Start the console. There's only one COM connection now. Make sure it's the same and hit connect. And it works just like before. After you've finalized everything and finished all your soldering, you might want to spray the PCB with a conformal coating. And this will protect it from future moisture related failures. 
obviously don't coat things with contacts like variable resistors and stuff.